Welcome to Way to Be TV, where there's a better way to be than atheist or theist. Last week, we looked at the 114 sayings of the Gospel of Thomas. And this week, we will be looking at the Gospel of Judas. I read the Gospel of Judas about seven or eight times this week. So, and I told you, you got some people on chat. Oh, you do? Okay, what, what, who have we got? Amber and Jan and Colleen. Oh, cool. What have they, they got to say? Anything? Just so far, hello. <laughs> okay. But it starts out just like kind of like the Gospel of Thomas does, the secret account of the revelation that Jesus spoke in a conversation with Judas Iscariot during a week, three days before they celebrated Passover. And it talks about them doing a Eucharist meal and Jesus seeing them do it, and they laugh, or he laughs at them. And they, and they, and, uh, they say, why are you laughing at us? We're doing what's right. And Jesus says, I'm not laughing at you. And they said, well, you are the Son of God. And Jesus says, how do you know me? No one in this generation knows me at all, he says. And he also says that, is there any one of you strong enough to stand and look me in the face? And no one stood up but Judas. And he couldn't look Jesus in the face. But he said, I know who you are and where you have come from. You are from the immortal realm of Barbalo. And from here on out, it gets even weirder, obviously. But Jesus says he's going to tell him about the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And, he's, and he says, you won't get there, Judas, but you'll suffer. And then Jesus walks away and he appears to the disciples again later on. And, and they said, where'd you go? And they, he said, I went to another great and holy generation. And the disciples tell him about a vision they had. They said, we saw a vision of a house and there were these 12 priests in it. The house had an altar and there were these 12 priests and they were sacrificing their children and their wives and doing all kinds of debauchery and whatnot. And Jesus says, those you have seen receiving the offering at the altar, that is who you are. That is the God you serve, and you are those 12 men you have seen there. And then Jesus tells Judas how things will be for Judas. Uh, and he said, you will become the 13th, and you will be cursed by the other generations, and you will come to rule over them. And then Jesus relates what I'm calling this divine Big Bang theory, and he talks about the realm and how there's this cloud, and from the cloud, it's an illuminated cloud, and this from this cloud comes this self-generated entity, and so immediately all of this activity starts, and there's all kinds of things generated until we have 22 heavens, 72 luminaries, 360 firmaments, and finally we have these two clueless offspring of Sophia called Nebro and Sackloss, and they are the gods over this world, and this world is the realm of chaos. Nebro means rebel, and Sackloss means fool. And said, then Sackloss and said to his angels, let us create human beings after the likeness and after the image. They fashioned an Adam and his wife Eve, who's called in the cloud Zoe. The uh, gospel actually ends, not at the resurrection, but it ends, it says, they approached Judas and said to him, what are you doing here? You are Jesus' disciple. And Judas answered them as they wished, and he received money and handed him over them. And that's the end of the Gospel of Judas. There is no resurrection. There is no passion story. There is nothing like that. And instead, what you have is the whole thing ending before the resurrection. And the reason for that is the Gospel of Judas is not about the resurrection. Gnosticism is not about the resurrection. The glorified body that we talk about in Christianity is something that's going to rot on earth, according to Gnosticism. But some people have a divine spark in them, and that divine spark is going to make its way back to from where it came. It's going to go back to the divine realm. We cannot solve a supernatural argument. Obviously, there's no way to prove either one. There's no way to falsify either one. Instead, what you have is two supernatural stories. One paints God one way, and one paints a bunch of gods, has a whole bunch of gods. Another one paints Jesus one way, and the other one uh, paints him another way. 
So let's see here if, I, if there's anything else I need to say before to get you kind of caught up. And I don't mind catching you up. Um, Thank you. Let's see. One side uh, said the world was created by a rebel and a fool. The other side says it was created by the one true God. One side said Jesus was both God's son and a God itself. The other said Jesus came from Barbalo, not uh, and not from the creator of this world, which happens to be the rebel and the fool. Concerning death, one said that we'd have a glorified body after death. The other side said some will rot in the ground, and the and and the other, the divine those who have a divine spark, that divine spark will make its way back to heaven because it knows where it came from. And then concerning uh, the authority of the apostles, one side said it's all about the apostles, everything about it. They named the books after them. The church leaders were thought to be descendants of the apostles, all kinds of things, or at least all the traditions were handed down, and what they were doing was apostolic tradition. The other side says the apostles sacrificed their wives and children and did all kind of debauchery. Both sides see themselves as knowing where they came from. Both sides see themselves as knowing where they are going. Both sides see themselves as orthodox. Both sides see themselves as knowing the truth. The one thing we said we were not going to do and looking at these um, ex-canonical go Gospels, where we, we were not going to try to solve a supernatural argument. Right. Neither side is verifiable. Neither side is falsifiable. And here we have nothing to contribute to the way. The Gospel of Judas is simply a supernatural story like so many in the Bible that we have today. And that's, that's a fast rendition of what I said before you came on, I think. But Thank you. Okay, Jan said, didn't the Gospel of Judas talk about people worshiping different gods? The Gospel does talk about them worshiping different gods, but not really in the, in the, in the manner that you think about. The, the Gospel of Judas talks about there being all these different gods, but this world was ruled by these, the, the, the fool and the, and the rebel. Let's see what and that got. we are all trying to evolve in, in our spiritual evolution? I think we all are trying to evolve in our spiritual evolution. I guess the, the question always becomes, what do you mean by spiritual? Sounds like way to be. So, yeah. It's, uh, I, don't know, I don't know if it sounds like way to be or not. but I'm not so sure it is a supernatural story. It sounds like two different forces at play. Those that believe that he, Jesus, was a traitor, and those that believe he was a highly evolved person like Jesus. If you, if you read... Whatever you find in Mark on Judas, and then whatever you find in Matthew on Judas, and go all the way out and read what you find in John on Judas, you're going to find that the personality, character, and motives of Judas change just like the personality and motives and, and character of Jesus changes uh, mm -hmm. while, while you go through that process. Because you're, you're running over a period of 65 years where everything got bolder and more blatant. Did the two groups just fight with supernatural stories? And, and that neither one of them are anything coming out of what would be I would call genuine Jesus tradition because if Jesus was a simple man with a simple story teaching the way to be in life such that you live in community with other people in a, in a more peaceful and content manner, if that's what Jesus was doing and they added all this stuff in on top of it, then I don't have much of an appreciation for either group, quite frankly. Catholic Sunday Sermons... And we call them missiles, all said the book of Jude is ended because he killed himself. Therefore, he did not know of the resurrection and the ascension. That, and she never learned that Judas even had a book until high school. Right, right. The, the thing was actually discovered in about 1978. And uh, a farmer out somewhere in the late 70s, they don't know exactly when because they can't find the farmer either, he found these these book this uh, Gospel of Judas. He sold it to somebody, sold more than one time. It was stolen one time. It got lost again and put in a in a safe deposit box in Hicksville, New York. Right, <coughs> and it sat in that safety deposit box for sixteen years. And that the most damage that's been done to the Gospel of Judas was done laying in that safety deposit box for 16 years. The antique dealer that had it took it to Yale University and, and they helped verify it. But it was a long process and so from the late 70s until about 
I think it first hit the public in 2006, about 10 years ago. But there was a secret deal between Judas and, and Jesus. And that deal was Judas would be the one that would make Jesus fulfilling his destiny possible. And so what I see this is an argument between two groups of people fighting over how many people will follow us, how many people follow them. Jan says, so if you don't believe in the supernatural, how did you think we come up? We come, how do we think we come of a conscious mind being and what do you think happens to our spirit when we die? I, I personally think we are natural human beings born as the result of a natural process <laughs> and that we, we uh, are, as human beings, you know, have a um, certain set of abilities and characteristics that have come about by and I'll say the word evolution, <laughs> as far as the spirit goes, that's a very elusive word. Uh, most people today, especially in, in biblical scholarship, don't know how to really define the word spirit. And that's what you're asking me to do. I see myself that, in a way, I have no issue with talking about spirit. I see that there is something within myself that I can reach deeper down into that will let me go further than I would be able to go if I didn't stop and reach there. Now, <clears throat> but I believe it's a naturally, it's a naturally super process, not a supernatural process. As as far as where, what happens after you die, I think you live and then you die and then you don't exist anymore. Jane says, "Well, even if we evolved, we had to come from some start." You mentioned the Big Bang. Amber <laughs> says, "Some things just don't have an answer." And Colleen says, Big Bang or Holy Spirit, both a spark could be the same difference. And Jan goes back and says, some people do not identify as religious, but they believe that our spirit, our spark, lives on within the universe. Right. Mm -hmm. Amber, I missed you, but when you said some things don't have an answer... Amen, sister. <laughs> Many Colleen, answers, Colleen says her grandson asked what would happen if everyone he sees and knows are only in his dreams. And then Jan says, but the hat and the table are made up of atoms that are in constant motion. We just can't see it. Oh, no, that's true. That's true. Yeah. We, we all raised our families. If, we, if, we, if we've had kids or if we've got nieces and nephews, we've tried to impart to them right and wrong. And that, for the biggest part in the United States, that comes from religion. That it, Unfortunately, it's true uh, that I was raised in a Christian home and you were raised in a Christian home. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our values that have stuck with us that we tried to pass on to our children came from our parents who were trying to impart a Christian right. uh, attitude. Oh, yeah. Yeah, without question. And I, I have that in my notes for tonight. One thing that's very important, I was raised Christian. You know, I was raised Christian by generations of Christians. And I do not, and I want to make that clear, regret that. I believe there is good that comes from it. I think there's a certain aspect of, especially childhood in Christianity, that causes you to think about a lot of things most children don't think about. You know, and, and I think it's good for you. However, there is also... A ton of guilt uh, for things that 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 you don't want to talk about. There's a, there's a ton of um, worry, and there's a ton of um, feeling like you're not going to be loved, that that you're going to come up short. Okay, there's a ton of stomping on your head that goes on too. Is my point. And so we need to understand that that that. And I've said this every almost every show, and that is there's a lot good about Christianity. But there's also some things that haven't worked out very well for certain people. We tend to organize for the masses. It's just like a restaurant, you know, or most places. Until ADA came along, a person in a wheelchair couldn't go hardly anywhere. Nowhere. Okay? Well, the same thing is, is true with Christianity. They, they organize for the masses. And so, how think about the history of... Christianity's relationship, white Christianity's relationship with blacks in this country. Think about white Christianity's uh, and black Christianity's relationship with women as opposed to men in this country. 
Think about, you know, the gay population and the gay rights movement and what's still going on right now in a way of pushback related to that. You know, there are so many things where Christianity panders to exactly what I believe the Christians of the first and second and third centuries were pandering to and trying to build an audience and a crowd. I mean, you can't really have this without money coming in, you know, and without support coming in and without free labor showing up. Okay? You really can't. And guilt, part, a big, guilt is a big part of that. Absolutely. Guilt is a big part of that. We're going we're gonna to go to credits, and I appreciate you guys being here. And love you all, and have a great week, and I'll, I'll see you next Thursday.